Picture this, the emergency department. It's chaotic, it's unpredictable, and every single second matters. In an environment like this, the very first, most critical step is to create order out of that chaos. We have to make sure the sickest patients get care first. So let's break down exactly how that happens. So how is it actually done? How do you possibly manage a never-ending flow of patients where every single person has a unique and often urgent need? Well, the answer is a systematic process called triage, and it's really both an art and a science. At its heart, triage is really all about sorting. The number one goal is to quickly, and I mean quickly, identify the patients who have life-threatening conditions. A good triage system doesn't just improve patient outcomes, it makes the whole department more reliable and helps us use our limited, precious resources in the most effective way possible. Now, we're going to be focusing on the Canadian system today, but it's really important to know that triage isn't a one-size-fits-all kind of thing. There are different systems used all over the globe, like the START system and the Emergency Severity Index in the U.S., or the Australasian and Manchester triage systems. But you know what? They all share the exact same goal. Get the right care to the right patient at the right time. Okay, so we've covered the what of triage, but what about the who? Who is the person making these split-second, high-stakes calls? You see, doing triage well takes a really unique blend of skills. This is not just about following a checklist. It's all about the clinician making that critical first assessment. Let's start with the personal stuff. A great triage clinician has to be flexible, but also assertive when they need to be. They're a compassionate, active listener, and honestly, a fierce advocate for their patients. And cognitively, the demands are just immense. This role requires razor-sharp critical thinking, the guts to make decisive calls under incredible pressure, and it all has to be backed by a massive knowledge base of emergency medicine. And, of course, behaviorally, a triage clinician has to be a rock star communicator who can stay cool, calm, and collected even when the entire department feels like it's spinning out of control. All right, with that foundation laid, let's zoom in on one of the most widely used systems out there, the Canadian Triage and Acuity Scale, or CTS for short. This is the framework that gives structure to all those critical decisions we've been talking about. So, CTAS is a five-level scale. Level one is for resuscitation. These are patients who need life-saving help right now. Level two is very urgent for conditions that could threaten life or limb, and the goal is to have them seen within five to ten minutes. Level three is urgent for serious problems that need attention within the hour. And then you have levels four and five, which are for less urgent or even non-urgent conditions. But you might be wondering, how do you decide between, say, a level 2 and a level 3 for someone with belly pain? Well, that's where modifiers come in. Think of them as key clinical clues that help you fine-tune a patient's score. CTAS uses two main types, first-order modifiers, which are the big red flags for immediate life threats, and second-order modifiers, which add important context, like how bad the pain is or how the injury happened. The most critical ones are these first-order modifiers. It all starts with vital signs, and we often use the quick ABCD approach to assess them. That's checking the patient's airway, their breathing, their circulation, and their disability or neurological status. Other huge flags are things like severe pain, major bleeding, or a dangerous temperature. These are the things that scream for immediate attention. Now, this whole system is kind of layered, right? And we're starting at the absolute foundation, the most important stuff, the first order modifiers. These are the hard data points, the no-nonsense numbers, your vital signs that give the first, most immediate sense of danger. Okay, first things first, breathing. This is a massive, massive clue. If someone is struggling so hard they're making a weird noise called stridor, or they literally can't speak, that's a red alert. We're talking level one, top priority. But even just the raw numbers are huge. A breathing rate that's way too slow, under 10, or way too fast, over 30, or an oxygen level below 92%, that automatically bumps the patient up to level two, urgent. All right, after breathing, we've got to know what's going on with circulation. And that means blood pressure. If that top number, the systolic, drops below 80, or you can barely find a pulse, we're in shock territory. That's a level one, no questions asked. Even if it's a little higher, say between 80 and 100, or their heart is just racing over 103 beats a minute, that's a level two. It's all about figuring out if blood is getting where it needs to go. So what about what's going on inside someone's head? You know, their level of awareness? For that, there's something called the Glasgow Coma Scale, or GCS. It's a score out of 15. The idea is simple. The lower the score, the bigger the problem. A score from 9 to 13, for instance, gets you a level 2. 
But there's one magic number, or maybe a not-so-magic number, that is an immediate, major red flag. And here it is. This is a huge deal. A GCS score of 8 or less, that is an automatic, straight-to-the-top, level 1. It means there could be a severe brain injury, that the person is so out of it they might not even be able to breathe on their own. It is one of the most serious signs a triage nurse can possibly see. You know, you might think temperature is just about having a fever, but it's way more than that. When you see a really high temp or even a really low one, and you combine it with other signs, like a heart thumping away at over 90 beats a minute or breathing faster than 20 times a minute, alarm bells for sepsis should be going off. That combo flags a patient as a level two. And if they're already showing signs of septic shock, like plummeting blood pressure, that's a level one emergency right there. Let's talk about pain for a second. And here's something you might not know. Not all pain is created equal in the ER. The system cares a lot more about where your pain is. It makes a huge distinction between central pain, think chest, belly, or head, and peripheral pain in your arms and legs. Why? Well, think about it. Severe pain in your chest is much more likely to be something life-threatening, like a heart attack, than severe pain in your wrist. And yeah, of course, how much it hurts definitely matters, especially for that central pain. If someone comes in and says their chest pain is an 8, 9, or 10 out of 10, boom, that's an instant level 2. Moderate pain will land you at a level 3, and mild at a 4. It's a really direct and powerful part of the calculation. All right, so those are the big initial clues, the vitals. They give us a starting point. But, and this is a big but, they don't tell the whole story. Now we get to the next layer of the investigation, what they call the second order modifiers. This is where it's less about the raw numbers and more about the specific context, which can change everything. The severity of pain is a really significant factor. For example, like severe central chest pain that comes on suddenly. That could easily elevate a patient to a CTS level two because it might signal something very serious underneath. You've probably heard the phrase, time is brain, when we talk about strokes. Well, in triage, that is literally everything. It's all about the clock. If a patient shows up with classic stroke symptoms, like weakness on one side, and it started less than four and a half hours ago, they're a level two. Why? Because they might still be in the window for powerful clot-busting drugs. But if those exact same symptoms started over six hours ago, the urgency drops to a level three. Time changes everything. Take blood sugar, for example. A super low number, like under three, is obviously a concern. But the real question is, does the patient have symptoms? Are they confused or drowsy? If the answer is yes, they shoot up to a level two. No symptoms? They're a level three. The same logic works for super high blood sugar. It's the symptoms that really crank up the urgency. Dehydration is another perfect example of this. You can literally see the progression of how bad it is. If a patient is so dehydrated they're in shock or they're lethargic, that's a level one, critical. But if they just have a fast heart rate and a dry mouth, that's considered moderate, a level two. It's a clear ladder, right? The worse the signs, the higher up the priority ladder you go. Okay, so we've got all these different pieces of the puzzle. Vitals, context, timing. How on earth does a triage nurse pull all of this together in just a couple of minutes? Well, it's all about combining those layers to build one complete, accurate picture of just how sick someone is. It's basically a super fast three-step checklist that's running in their head. Step one, get the hard numbers. Assess those first order modifiers, the vitals, the GCS, the pain. That gives them a baseline. Step two, add the context. Consider the second order modifiers like blood sugar or when that stroke started. This refines the picture. And finally, step three, put them together and make the call, assigning the final accurate CTAS level. And that quote just nails it, doesn't it? It's not about any one single piece of data. It's the fusion of both. The objective, hard numbers from the vitals combined with a specific human story of what's going on. That's the secret sauce that makes the whole system work. So the big takeaway here, that ER waiting room that looks so chaotic, it isn't a lottery at all. There's this whole hidden language running underneath it all, a system of modifiers and data points. And it's that system that turns potential chaos into a finely tuned process that, you know, literally saves lives by getting help to the people who need it most first. Theory is one thing, but the real test is seeing it in action. So let's walk through a few real-world clinical scenarios to see how these CTAS levels and modifiers all come together. All right, imagine this. A 56-year-old man walks into the ER. He's complaining of terrible chest pain. As you're looking at him from across the room, he suddenly just collapses. The team rushes over. His pulse is feeble. 
barely there at 30 beats per minute. He's not breathing at all. His blood pressure, you can't even record one. And his Glasgow Coma Scale, which measures consciousness, is a 3 out of 15. That's the lowest it can be. The entire clinical picture is, frankly, catastrophic. So what's the CTS level? There is absolutely no question this is an immediate level 1. The reasoning here is crystal clear. The unresponsiveness, the lack of breathing, the total hemodynamic collapse, these are all definitive signs of a life-threatening emergency. The system instantly flags this patient as the absolute highest priority in the entire hospital. Okay, for our next case, a patient rolls in by ambulance, they have a fever, they're short of breath, and the paramedic just tells you that they look very, very unwell. This patient gets triaged as a CTAS level 2. Now what's really key here is how those modifiers come into play. The shortness of breath is obviously a huge factor, but so are those more subjective but clinically vital modifiers like looks unwell or the suspicion that this could be sepsis. Those clues elevate the patient's acuity, making sure they are seen very, very urgently. And our final scenario, a 45-year-old man shows up with a sudden onset of weakness. He literally cannot move his left arm or his left leg. The immediate thought in everyone's mind is stroke. But here's the twist. Look at his vital signs. His blood pressure is normal, heart rate is great, he's breathing comfortably, and he's totally alert. I mean, on the surface, his vitals look reassuringly stable. So what level does he get? He has also assigned a CTS level 2. And this right here is where the brilliance of the system really shines through. You see, even with those stable vital signs, the presenting complaint itself, that sudden one-sided weakness, acts as a powerful second-order modifier. The system is smart enough to recognize this as a sign of a time-sensitive emergency, like a stroke, where immediate action is needed to save brain tissue. What these scenarios really show is that triage is so much more than just a waiting list. It's a dynamic, clinical process that literally sets the stage for everything that follows in a patient's journey through the emergency department. At the end of the day, accurate, efficient triage is the gateway to emergency medicine. Mastering a system like CTAS, understanding its levels, its modifiers, and how to apply it in the real world is absolutely fundamental. For everyone on the front lines, your critical thinking at that gateway, it truly makes all the difference.